in last month's Q&A when I asked you guys for questions. Boy, you guys asked me a lot of questions, and we're going to get to some of them in this month's Q&A. Hey, everybody. My name is Jimmy. I'm just drinking some Sam's Club Members Mark coffee, just whatever was in the coffee maker right now. If you want to tell me what kind of coffee you are drinking and have it featured just like these guys right here, you can leave that in the comments below. Speaking of that, this is the monthly Q&A that I do, and if you have a question that you want answered, and maybe I can answer it, you can put that in the comments below as well, and it might get on next month's Q&A. Cheers, guys. Let's start with Luca's Model Trains. They ask, is there an easier way to do DCC other than Arduinos? And the answer is yes. There are plenty of companies that make DCC starter systems out there. Some of the ones that are here in the States include Digitrax, NCE, MRC, also Bachman makes a DCC system, and let's see here, who else? TCS makes a DCC system. And for those, some of the most popular starter systems are the NCE system and the Digitrack Zephyr system. And one of the easiest ones to use is the first one that I have, which is the Bachman Easy Command system. You can buy that separately, or you can buy it as part of a starter set as well. And you can have like up to nine or 10 locomotives with some basic functions, and it kind of gets your toes wet in DCC. But there are quite a few starter sets out there. One of the big advantages of doing something like DCC EX is that you get to save a lot of money on it. It's got a little bit higher level of entry to it because of the skills of some of them that are needed, but it's really not that much. But yes, you do not have to use Arduinos for DCC. Jeff Harley asks, when you install turnouts, do you need a right and left to meet up properly with the second track? Now, if you're using set track or track with road bed like Cotter Unitrack, Bachman Easy Track, if you're going to O scale Lionel Fast Track, or any of the set track like Atlas Set Track or Pico Set Track that does it that is pretty rigid, yes, you're gonna want those to line up properly with the second track. I'm assuming you're talking about parallel tracks. Now, if you're using Flex Track, this gives you a bit more flexibility, probably part of the name of it there. And you can make things line up a little bit easier, but it does take a little bit more skill to plan out and lay out. So if you're using the rigid set track or track with row bed like I use back here, definitely you need to make them meet up properly with the second track. Otherwise, you can use flex track to get around it and get everything perfect for you. But overall, you do want turnouts to line up pretty well. Dave Davis asked a question that I've actually never even really thought about before, and it's got me intrigued. He says he's looking for alternatives other than powder or granular to use his road bed on the sides of his Kato Unitrack. He's looking at paperbacked things like you have with paperbacked grass, and he asked if I have any ideas. Well, this idea has got me thinking so much that I think I'm going to have to do a video on this. Right now, my thought is to use something like the material you use in like a veil, um, just the little netting that you use in a veil, and glue road bed on it, and then cut it and put it on the track where you need it. But I have to think about that, and I have to see if it'll work. So I'm going to do some testing, and if it works, I'm going to do a video on it. If not, I'll just mention it in another Q&A. But it's got me intrigued, and I want to try it. Jamie Garcia asks if it's possible to control a tortoise or cobalt switch machine by assigning it an address if it were a locomotive. He says he has an MRC Prodigy command station with two controls and it works great and he wants to add this feature. Well, by default, a tortoise is an analog thing. It's just a motor that goes slowly and moves the pin for that. But Circuitron, the company that makes the tortoise, makes another switch machine called the Smail, which is basically a tortoise with DCC functionality. So you can get that. It costs about 30 bucks per switch machine. And if you already have tortoise switch machines, I've never used Cobalt, so I'm just going to speak to tortoise right now. Um, if you have a tortoise switch machine already installed, you can look at DCC Specialties, and they have a product called the Hair 2, which is a stationary decoder that is designed to snap on to the tortoise switch machine where you have the little pads right there, and it just pops right on there. So you have some options for not only installing it DCC friendly mechanisms, such as the Smail, and you also can upgrade your tortoises with that hair too. And it's gonna be right around the same cost if you were to swap them out versus adding on. So those are your options for making tortoises really 
DCC equipped if you don't want to go the heavy DIY route. Jason, aka the train freak, how you doing Jason? Ask if I had any thoughts about the NMRA and the standards they set. Do I try to stick with manufacturers that follow those standards or just use whatever? And have I looked into any of their AP certificates and what it requires to be a master model railroader? Well, I have not looked into any of those certificates and what it takes to be a master model railroader, though I probably should. That'd be interesting to look at. And then we talk about the standards. The standards are overall a really good thing for model railroading. When you have a hobby or something that requires stuff that works from different manufacturers to work together on very similar things like track or DCC, you need an outside body that sets the standards that they are going to operate with. And I'm really talking about like gauge and I'm talking about wheels and all of those different things. So the NMRI not only has standards, but they also have things that are like best practices and things like that. One big thing that has helped me out a ton recently, and if you really think about it, it's helped me out for a while, is NMRA's DCC standards. Now, yes, DCC standards are great because they mean you can use decoders from different companies and all that kind of stuff and make them all work together. But the thing that's really helped me out recently is I've been doing a lot of conversions of non-DCC ready locomotives, older locomotives, to DCC. And the NMRA, the NMRA has a set wiring scheme for those decoders. So I'm able to just open up a decoder, look at it, and know where to connect the wires. I don't have to know what wires for which manufacturer I am hooking up because I'm using different manufacturers for different installations. So overall, the NMRA is a very good thing for the hobby and having standards like this in the hobby are a good thing and are pretty much necessary for it as well. Dan's Hobby says that he has a 21 pin Soundtracks decoder and he can't get it to speed match. CV5, which is the one that is the V max if you're using the three values to speed match rather than the speed table, it can only go up to a value of 63. Now, normally that's supposed to be able to go up to, six, or to 255 on the vast majority of decoders you're going to encounter. So this is an issue. And there are a couple things that could be wrong. One, overall, the decoder could just be kind of messed up and you need to reset it. We'll get that to a second. But you could also have a lock decoder if you didn't buy this decoder brand new out of the box. So let's say you bought a locomotive with this decoder already installed off eBay or in a model train show or something like that, and it worked just fine. And maybe the person who was running it set the speed really low because they had a switching layout or this locomotive prototypically did not, didn't want to run fast no matter what. Well, you may be dealing with a locked decoder. Now, you'll know this if you can't read other CVs. So this may not be the issue if you can see that it's a, C it's a CV of 63 on CV5. Now, the lock mechanism is controlled by CV15, CV16, and CV30. To enable the lock, you will work with CV30. CV16 is the actual lock, and CV15 functions as the key to that lock. And this is probably fairly complicated and you're probably like, whoa, 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 you're talking a lot of things right here. George over at Soundtracks has done a fantastic video on decoder locks and I'm going to put that right up here as well as in the description below. So definitely check that out if you have more interest in that. Now, if it's not locked, you can always try a factory reset of the decoder by setting CV8 to a value between 8 and 13. I hope this helps, Dan. If you have any questions, you can leave them in the comments below. Also, don't forget to tell me what kind of coffees you guys are drinking. I love seeing those. Until next time, I'm Jimmy from the DIY and Digital. Stay safe, be kind, drink some coffee, and happy railroading.